and he just piled the kids into the car. I gave him a wave and I left. And I hate that because that was the last moment that I got to see him and it wasn't like, you know, a conversation. My name is Karen Millsap, hear my story. My family, I'm the baby of four, just a tomboy and loved life and loved exploring. And So Rich and I met, yeah, about two years after I graduated. We met at a, a mutual friend's birthday party. We dated for three years and then we got married and we didn't have a big wedding. We literally were like, you ready to get married? Yeah, sure, let's do this. Went down to the courthouse, called our pastor. He married us that evening and that was it. I didn't need to have a, a big wedding. I, I just wanted to be married to the love of my life. And so um, we already had Caleb at that time. He was four months old when we got married. And, um, and then we started doing all of the big kid stuff like buying a house and you know getting a new car because we want to have more kids and just and in the midst of all of that he wanted to start a CrossFit gym and so that was the beginning of CrossFit Mosaic he stepped out on faith and um, we stepped out on that together and just dove right into everything adulting it was a normal day I went to the gym and I happened to get a phone call on my way there um, and so I was on the phone and he just piled the kids into the car I gave him a wave and I left and I hate that because that was the last moment that I got to see him and it wasn't like you know a conversation got myself home got myself situated I noticed that my phone my cell phone starts buzzing and when I flipped the phone over the caller had just stopped, but I saw that it was multiple calls from the same person. And this person was somebody who was at the gym. So of course we have a million thoughts that can go through in a matter of a second, right? She's calling again and I answer and all I hear is screaming. And I can't make out any words except for shot. I hang up the phone, I pick up my son and I start bouncing him because I don't want him to feel what's happening to my body. I take him over to the neighbors and I just said, I'm not sure what happened, but I just need you to hold Caleb for a little bit. And I thought to myself, all this time has passed. Why am I not on my way to the hospital? It had been at least 20 minutes since, if not longer, since I got the first phone call. So why wouldn't it? But it still didn't click in my head that he died. So I pull up to, um, to where the gym was and and I saw that it was blocked off from the road and that all the first responders were there, newscasters were there with their trucks already. I mean, it was like, it was chaos. And so I don't remember um, a lot about me first getting there or what happened or who, I, I don't even remember who told me or how they told me that he didn't make it. I, I have no memory of that. But I do remember just sitting behind this bush and just rocking back and forth and just saying, this isn't real. Like this is, this is not real. You don't imagine things like this to happen. And there's no way that you would imagine that it would come in your life. So we were at the crime scene till like one o'clock in the morning, maybe. I go back home and a friend of mine is with me and I'm sitting there, we're outside and, um, and I'm still having those thoughts like, God, I need you to be real. Like, in order for me to get through this, you need to be deliberately audible. I don't want to guess. I don't want to like wonder, oh, is that a sign from God? Like, no, I need for you to really speak to me so I know what's up. And um, as we're sitting there and I'm having all these demands in my head, I look over and for the first time in my life, I see a shooting star. And so I was like, okay, wait, was that you? <laughs> and then I think to myself, well, you can't do it again. And I look over and I see a second. And it was in that moment that I really felt like, okay, God gave me a sign that I asked for in the moment that I needed. And if he can give me some little sign that Richard is okay, then I'm just gonna have faith that he's gonna get me through this. Cause I don't even know how I can take my first step. And that was the beginning. So one of the unique parts about this story is that there was never closure. The guy who came in, who shot my husband, it's been five years and we still don't know who that person is. And I remember meeting a widow and she's the only other widow who I met whose husband was killed, but they knew who shot him like when it happened. And I remember her telling me, she said, your healing cannot be wrapped up in knowing who this person is because what if you never find out? You're never gonna heal. 
So although I had that inkling kind of early on before I met her, like, I need to make a choice. I need to make these decisions to move forward, to heal, whether or not they catch this guy or not. I mean, this was like very, very, very early on that I still had that hope. But when I met her, she affirmed that my healing was my responsibility. When she walked into the courtroom with the gentleman who killed her husband, she thought she would walk out feeling a thousand times better. She was gonna feel lighter, there was gonna be closure. She said, I walked into that courtroom and I walked out feeling the exact same way after his sentencing. So for me, I think I needed to own the fact that if we never find this person, that I have chosen my path from this experience. And that's what I did. So I started down this journey of saying, well, I'll help other widows transition back to work. I realized that it wasn't just about widows. It was about the kind of environment that we have in corporate America where we don't want to talk about grief. We don't want to talk about loss. We don't want to talk about life. We just expect people to come in there and be robotic. And so it started with how do I cure grief in the workplace? That was my first, like, let me try to make this um, good, take this pain and make it into something that's purposeful. And then it just evolved and evolved because so many people were drawn to the gravity of my story. So I started to share my story and my journey and, and just became open to, to speaking on different stages, um, helping men and women, um, but more so of like, what is that pathway back to a whole heart? How do I apply this to my life? And I think that the best part about it is that I've been able to normalize conversations about grief because a lot of times people think that grief is just the result of a death and it's not. Grief is when we expect things to be different or better or more and it doesn't turn out that way. You know, I've helped women who've had multiple miscarriages, who've been through divorce, who are, have gone through transitions in their job and they feel like, I didn't expect to be here. Like, what am I supposed to do with my life now, you know? People who have battled addiction. I mean, there are just so many different things that we grieve, that we experience stress through and pain through. And we need to have those kind of conversations because once we have those conversations about grief and we know that it's normal, then we can have more productive conversations about healing so people have those tools and they can move forward. If you're living with grief, if you feel totally consumed by whatever loss or pain or tragedy has you where you are right now, you have two choices. You can either give up or you can get up. But getting up is the way to go. There's so much life to live and fear or doubts or just hurt and pain will block blessings from you. It's okay to feel those things, but don't let them control you. Get up.